Thursdays and Saturdays. Market days in Bishop Auckland. Perhaps not quite so full on a day like today of bustle and busyness as it usually is, but still the eternal tribal dance of English shopper and stall holder. Can't resist it. Always find myself getting drawn into the eternal search for the perfect bargain. Just love it. But this place looks and feels a lot different the rest of the week. It's a huge square with buildings on an island in the middle of it, and it used to be one of the busiest tea junctions in County Durham. But now, in these days of bypasses, there's only a trickle of traffic, and to replace it, they've put in a pedestrian area and lots of trees. The trees are smashing, but the pedestrian area is a disappointment. Pedestrian areas are often the perfect solution to a town's problems, but here, I don't know, it just seemed to have chopped the town in two. But there are some splendid buildings. The Victorian Town Hall with its French-style mansard roof and its fat squat pillars with their excellent carved capitals and its nice balcony. The church next door dates from the same period, the 1850s, Quite simple in the early English style with lancet windows, but very agreeable, especially the clever little bell tower. And behind the church, there's another very French touch, this fun corner tower on the former planning department of all places. And further round, these charming little almshouses of 1662, rebuilt in 1845. Nice and chummy, really, but let down by this surprising pocket of dereliction on the other side of the road. These are good buildings, and I hope they can be used before it's too late and they get replaced with stuff like this on the other side of the marketplace. This kind of building does nothing for the square, and nor do signs like these. Too big, too garish, too plastic. The pedestrianisation has affected Bondgate too. This was one of the original medieval streets when the ancient borough was founded back in 1243, and it could be like a medieval street still, narrow and curving. There are still marvellous bright moments, but now it's a dead end, and this is the effect, sadness and dereliction. What a curate's egg of a town this is. Good things and bad things jostling side by side. Right, Grundy. Time to stop moaning, not another grumble. Concentrate on the good things for a while. There's a view that looks a bit more worthy of Bishop Auckland. That gateway leads to Bishop Auckland's finest building and to a unique chapter in English history. And there it is, the palace of the Prince Bishops of County Durham. Here, everything's a bit on the grand side. The chapel, more gothic than gothic, with its forest of finials and busy traceried windows. The outer walls were effaced with this unusual patterned rustication in the 1660s. Inside, it takes your breath away. It feels so different to any other church in the area, high and light and airy. Originally, the chapel was the palace banqueting hall, built in the 12th century, but it was converted into a chapel by Bishop Cozen in 1661 to 65, and it was he who introduced this marvellously rich screen with the most unusual combination of Gothic and Renaissance decorations. But who were the Prince Bishops, I hear you ask, and why did they have a palace here at Bishop Auckland? Well, William the Conqueror needed help to control the North, so he made the Bishop of Durham a Prince Bishop, with the King's own power to raise an army, to hold his own Parliament and make his own coin and create markets. The base became Durham Castle, but like the King, they had a few country palaces too, and one was Bishop Auckland. Part of being a powerful knight and bishop meant lavish entertaining, and that's where this building came in. It's a deer house of 1767, built in the bishop's very own palace deer park. And it served two purposes. 
First of all, of course, a shelter for the deer behind the outer arcade, while other deer were tended and fed in the inner cloister for the entertainment of the bishop's hunting parties high up in the pinnacle tower. A nice, playful bit of purpose-built design and a quite unique piece of townscape. Meanwhile, back in the marketplace, another of Bishop's main attractions, a half mile long shopping street, or a whole mile of shop frontage if you add both sides together. I don't think I've ever seen a shopping street as long as this before. It's so straight because it was a Roman road, the famous Deer Street from York to Corbridge. And along its length, a whole series of reminders as to how shopping fashions have changed over the years. There are a few surviving Victorian and Edwardian shop fronts, hints of an elegant past. There's the co-op, continuously expanding through the late 19th century as the West Durham coalfield expanded. And unfortunately, there's even more of the plastic signs, which are trying so hard to make every street look like any other street. And here, at last, the shops finally peter out, thank goodness. But the road itself keeps on going as straight as a die for another couple of miles or so, on into Bishop's later housing areas. This was a working town, and the place is full of solid, plain and well-kept terraces, just what you'd hope to find in a West Durham mining town. But even here, you can stumble upon little gems of townscape, such as Albert Hill by the railway line, lovely bow windows. Finally, the bandstand in the park. It stood here for, oh, about 90 years, but it's on the move. It'll probably be gone by the time you watch this. It's going to Beamish Museum. This story raises two issues for me. Firstly, there's the question of whether a building retains any value if it's taken down and put up again somewhere else. Is that what conservation's all about? And secondly, I find it quite revealing that the town should want to be rid of it. It's a nice thing. It's in a nice place. And soon it won't be here at all. Stories like that, fortunately, have recently led to the formation at last of a Bishop Auckland Civic Trust. And that seems to me to be a most hopeful sign, because good buildings in successful townscapes aren't a luxury that we can do without. They're essential to civilised living.